Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured, but the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. In Book 8 of St. Augustine's Confessions, there is an incredibly important turning point that I think many people remember with this crisis happening in the garden and Augustine is in great anguish, finding himself, you know, kind of divided. But there is something that helps to precipitate that that is narrated in Chapter 6 and Chapter 7, which is this encounter with uh, a guy who comes over and his name is Pontacianus, kind of a mouthful there to talk. And he narrates something that produces a crisis for Augustine. And I think that we need a little bit of context to make sense of this. Um, Augustine has been questing for a long time, ever since, he says, he read Cicero's Hortensius that awakened him, not just to philosophy, but the desire for wisdom. He is, he is looking for a way to understand himself, to understand God, to understand the human condition, to understand the universe, and to direct himself to direct not just his behavior, but his loves, what it is that he should be uh, effectively oriented towards. And so he has been living this common life with his friends for a while. We could mention Olypius, who gets uh, brought up a lot in the Confessions. There's others as well. And they are living a, a common life that is oriented towards some higher goods, towards justice and the virtues, towards trying to understand God towards trying to free themselves of the life that they had been stuck in before and to their own friendship with each other. And it's a pretty good life. It's not quite a monastic life, but it's, it's something you could say on the way to it. It's what we would nowadays call an intentional community, a community of friendship. And so this guy, uh, Pontacianus, comes to visit. Uh, he's, Augustine says that, um, you know, I was frequenting your church a lot. I had all these friends. And then we have uh, this, this fellow, Pontacianus, a countryman of ours, insofar as being from Africa, being from North Africa, right, uh, who held a high office at court. I don't know what he wanted from us, but as we sat down to talk together, he chanced to notice a book, a book that was laying on a gaming table. And this is a very interesting thing that we should have a little bit of a digression about. It's a book by who? By Paul, Paul the Apostle. Why would there be a book by itself, not part of a big bound codex that we call the Bible? Well, because when Augustine is talking about the Christian scriptures, he doesn't mean necessarily one big book that contains them all. There were all of these different books that would circulate independently of each other and might be read for their own sake. So a book by Paul would be one of the many letters that Paul has, has written. And so uh, Pontacianus notices this, uh, opens it up and found to a surprise it was by the Apostle Paul. He thought it was one or other of the books that I was wearying myself out in teaching. So books of rhetoric, books of literature, books of philosophy. And so he smiles and looks at me as if to congratulate me and express surprise that he suddenly found these writings and these alone before my eyes. Why? Because Pontacianus is a Christian. And so he's like, oh, this is cool. I mean, Augustine, are you actually a Christian? Are you just somebody interested in Christianity? You're reading a good part of it right here, you know? And so um, Augustine says, I told him how I expended very great pains on those scriptures. And then he says, a discussion came up in which he narrated the story of Anthony. So 
Ponticianus goes into several different discourses here that Augustine talks about. One is talking about the life of Anthony. And Ponticianus, is he narrating the entire life of Anthony? Maybe, probably not. Probably some of the key ideas. And then maybe explaining it along the way. Maybe Augustine gets to ask some questions. Who is Anthony? Anthony is an Egyptian monk. Why does it matter that he's an Egyptian monk? Is it, well, you know, he's located far away. Well, at that time, as we know by looking at other writers, monasticism was taking off in a lot of places. And one of the places where it was considered particularly austere was Egypt. As a matter of fact, when John Cassian, around this time, and his buddy are leaving the western area and going to Palestine to study with the monks there, the monks in Palestine are like, oh, you know, we're serious, but you want to see some serious monasticism? you got to go to Egypt, man. Check those guys out, right? And so the life of St. Anthony is talking not just about this guy, St. Anthony, but about the monastic way of life, right? So... Augustine goes on and says, his name was famous among your servants, but up to that very hour had been unknown to us. When he discovered this, he dwelt all the more on the subject, introducing the great man to those of us who were ignorant of him. And we stood in amazement on hearing such wonderful works of yours, deeds of recent memory, done so close to our own times and most fully testified to. All of us marveled, why? Not only because there had been such great wonders, but because we hadn't heard of it. And this is a common experience, isn't it? You get introduced to some great philosopher, some literary figure, or some you know, philanthropist, and you're like, how did I not know about this? And well, the answer is you weren't reading the right books or you weren't in the right circles. Then Ponticianus brings it a little bit closer to home. <clears throat> so there's this cool guy out in the desert who you know, we've got a life of, you know, there's actually people right here in, in your own environment who are doing Similar things. He says, from this subject, his discourse turned to the flocks within the monasteries. And Augustine is actually using that term, monasterium, right? And to their way of life. And it's, it's not just the fact that people are going into monasteries. That's less interesting than where, how, in what way they're living. And, and Augustine has a great metaphor here to you, which is like a sweet-smelling odor to you and to the fruitful deserts and the wilderness, of all of which we knew nothing. There was a monastery at Milan, a city that Augustine knows, right? There was a monastery at Milan filled with good brothers, situated outside the walls, under the fostering care of Ambrose, the bishop, but we had not known about it. He proceeded with his account, and we kept silent and attentive. So now we've got two things being talked about. Listen, there's monks nearby. You know, there's monks in the, in the desert of Egypt. Cool story about one of them. By the way, I myself ran into a house like this, and I saw two uh, worldly men get converted. So he says... He told us how three and of, he and three of his associates, uh, it was at Trier one afternoon, went out for a walk in the gardens along the walls. They chanced to walk in pairs. One went apart with him. The other two wandered off by themselves. So the other two find a house. It's translated as house. A cottage, really. A little tiny place. A casa in Trier. And uh, his, his, these two buddies go in. And there they found a little book in which was written... The life of Anthony. So the life of Anthony shows up twice in this story. One of them began to read this book, to marvel at it, and to be aroused by it. As he read it, he began to meditate on taking up such a life. Now, this, you could say, well, this is a midlife crisis, right? Uh, these are successful people. They're actually like special agents, agentis in rebus, right? Uh, so they, they're, they're important guys. They've got careers, and they read this book. And, and so the one reads it, and he's like, you know, my life is kind of a waste, actually, he says, the reader suddenly filled with holy love and sober shame. Now, here's something really interesting. Made angry with himself. Turned his eyes upon his friend and said, tell me, I ask you, where will we get by all these labors of ours? What are we seeking for? What purpose do we serve in office? What higher ambition can we have at court than to become friends of the emperor? Is this what we want? Or do we want something better for ourselves? 
let's, let's quit. Let's, let's join up here. Let's, let's become monks. Let's live like St. Anthony. And there's, again, it's mentioned this anger. As he read and turned upon the waves of his heart, he raged at himself for a while, but then discerned better things and determined upon them. This is a common experience. Where, like, How could I have been so, so stupid, right? How, what's going on with me? You know, this is a common experience in spiritual life. Interestingly, I mentioned John Cassian earlier. John Cassian is a little more restrictive about anger than Augustine himself is. And John Cassian says the only kind of anger that's good is the anger you feel towards yourself and at your sins and your own anger. And that's what these guys are feeling. And so they have decided to change their lives. Now Pontacianus and his companion arrive and as he says, um, they are themselves changed, but they, um, he says, in, in no wise changed from their, although in no wise changed from their for, former state, nevertheless wept over it as he affirmed, congratulated them devoutly, recommended themselves to their prayers. So Pontacianus is going to continue on doing what he does. Now, very, very interesting. What sort of effect does this story have on Augustine? We can think about possible effects that this could have. You could be like, you know, the proverbial, cool story, bro, which is dismissive. Oh, I don't care about this silly story of, you know, people changing their lives and all that. Augustine has the opposite reaction. He takes it to heart. He tells us, this is the beginning of chapter 7, Pontacianus told us this story, and as he spoke, you... O oh Lord, turn me back on myself. So this metaphor here is a spatial metaphor. Augustine is you know, looking out. He's, his hearing is going out to the world and to other things. And God has Augustine turned in, converted, you could say, upon himself. And uh, you know, Augustine says, I didn't really want to look on myself. You stood me face to face with myself. So that... I can see why, how I actually am, how foul I was, how deformed, how defiled, how covered with stains and sores. I looked and I was filled with horror. And, you know, what's the natural reaction to that? I, I don't want to look at this. Where can, I, where can I go instead? And he says, there was no place for me to flee to away from myself. I tried to turn my gaze from myself, but Pontacianus still went on with the story that he was telling and once again, you placed me in front of myself and thrust me before my own eyes so that I could see how badly off I was. And Augustine isn't really that badly off, right? He says, um, many years had flown by since, you know, uh, when I was reading Cicero's Hortensius, I was aroused to a zeal for wisdom, but I delayed to despise earthly happiness and devote myself to that search. I wanted to, so to speak, have it all. I want to, like, look for wisdom, but I also want to, uh, you know, as we would say, screw around, <laughs> quite literally. One of the problems for Augustine, as we hear him later on saying, is, you know, give me chastity and continence, but not yet. I still like to have some, some sex from time to time, that comfort, right? And so Augustine is, is you know, wavering between these things. And it, when it comes to that prayer, he says, I feared you would hear me quickly and that quickly you would heal me of that disease of lust, which I wish to have satisfied rather than extinguished. And so this is what Augustine is feeling thinking, trying to figure out as he's listening to Pontacianus talking about these monks, people who have made a decision to leave those things behind and to devote themselves as exclusively as they can to loving and understanding God and indeed serving their neighbors within the monastery. So Augustine, this is part of what is going to precipitate that famous scene in the garden where he's, he's wavering back and forth. It's interesting, we should close this out, how the stories that others tell us, stories in this case that incorporate others' stories, can have such a profound effect on us at the right time. Not necessarily in a universal, catch-all, applies to everybody at every point in time way, they're instead stories that hit us at the right point and then can allow, as Augustine says, God to act within 
our lives, our thoughts, our affections, and to be drawn into seeing ourself, not in the story that's being told, but in the implications of the story. The story, even though it's not about us, applies to us. And that is what happens in this famous uh, set of passages within these two chapters in book eight. Uh, 